Namaskar. In this session, we shall be looking into the important judgments passed in the month of March 2023. Let me take you to those judgments. A few judgments from the civil law. The first is the Chairman and Managing Director, City Union Bank Limited, and another versus R. Chandra Mohan. This judgment pertains to Consumer Protection Act 1986. It says that the proceedings before the commission being summary in nature, the complaints involving highly disputed question of facts or the cases involving tortious acts of criminality like fraud and cheating could not be decided by the forum or commission under the said act. The deficiency in service as well settled has to be distinguished from the criminal acts or tortious acts. There could not be any presumption with regard to the willful fault, imperfection, shortcoming or inadequacy in the quality, nature and manner of performance and service as contemplated in section 2 subsection 1 clause G of the Act. The burden of proving the deficiency in service would always be open upon the person alleging it. Next judgment is Director General Durdarshan. Prasad Bharti Corporation versus Srimati Maggie H. Desai. It pertains to Rule 13, Central Civil Services Pension Rule 1972. The question before Honorable Supreme Court was whether service rendered as casual or contractual can be said to be service rendered in a substantive appointment. It was held by Honorable Supreme Court that no, uh, the same cannot be counted towards the qualifying services for pensionary benefits. Rule 13 of 72 rules provides for commencement of qualifying service. As per Rule 13, qualifying service of a government servant shall commence from the date he takes the charge of the post to which he is first appointed either substantively or in an officiating or temporary, cap temporary capacity. It further provides that such officiating or temporary service is followed without inter interruption by substantive appointment in the same or another service or post. Therefore, the service rendered on a substantive post or services rendered as officiating or temporary service shall be treated as qualifying service. Service rendered as casual or contractual cannot be said to be officiating or temporary service. Even the services rendered as temporary service can be considered as qualifying service provided that the officiating or temporary service is followed without interruption by substantive appointment in the same or another service or post. Service rendered as casual or contractual cannot be said to be service rendered on a substantive appointment. The next case is uh, from Section 34, Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. That is Indian Railway Construction Company Limited versus Messrs National Building Construction Corporation Limited. In this case, it was held by Honorable Supreme Court while setting aside the order of the High Court that the High Court exceeded in the jurisdiction under Section 34 of the Arbitration Act, quashing and setting aside the well-reasoned award passed by the Arbitral Tribunal. The High Court has not at all considered Section 31, Subsection 7, Clause A of the Arbitration Act, which permits the arbitrator that unless otherwise agreed by the parties, where and in so far as an arbitral award is for the payment of the money, the arbitral tribunal may include in the sum for which the award is made interest at such rate as it deems reasonable for the whole or any part of the period between the date on which the cause of action arose and the date on which the award is made. Thus, unless there is a specific bar under the contract, it is always open for the arbitrator or arbitral tribunal to award pendant light interest. The case of Ravichi and Company versus Union of India was also referred to by Honorable Supreme Court. The next case is Ashutosh Samantha versus Rajan Bala Dasi and others, 2023 Supreme Court cases online SC255 pertaining to Section 90 of Indian Evidence Act that wills cannot be proved only on the basis of their age. The presumption of Section 90 as to the regularity of the documents more than 30 years of age is inapplicable when it comes to proof of wills. Wills have to be proved in terms of Section 63, subsection C of the Succession Act 1925 and Section 68 of the Evidence Act 1872. The cases MB Ramesh D by LRS versus KM Viraje by LRS and others was also referred to. 
The next case is Ganesh Prasad versus Rajeshwar Prasad and others, which pertains to Section 60 of Transfer of Property Act 1882, which speaks with regard to the right of redemption of mortgage. It was held that unless the equity of redemption is so extinguished, a second suit for redemption by the mortgager, if filed within the period of limitation, is not therefore barred. In other cases, under Order 9, Rule 9, CPC, uh, in the same case only, that is in Ganesh Prasad, it was held that if the right of redemption is not in extinguished, the provision like Order 9, Rule 9 of the CPC will not debar the mortgager from filing a second suit because in a partition suit, the cause of action in redemption is a recurring one. The cause of action in each successive action until the right of redemption is extinguished or a suit for redemption is time barred is a different one. In the same case only, with regard to Order 6, Rule 17, CPC, it was held that a party is entitled to take alternative pleas in support of its case. Plaintiff is entitled to plead even inconsistent pleas while seeking alternative reliefs. Inconsistent and contradictory allegations in negation to the admitted position of facts or mutually destructive allegations of facts should not be allowed to be incorporated by means of amendment to the pleadings. The next case is P. Shamala versus Gundular Mastan. In this case, which pertains to Section 28 of Specific Relief Act 1963, it was held that the court cannot, as a matter of course, allow extension of time for making payment of balance amount of consideration in terms of a decree. The court has to see all the attendant circumstances, including if the Wendy has conducted himself in a reasonable manner under the contract of sale. The power under Section 28 of the Specific Relief Act is discretionary and the court has to pass an order as the justice may require. The case of V.S. Palanchami, Chittiar firm versus C. Algappan and another was also referred to. The last case with regard to the civil law is the state of Gujarat and others versus Jayanti Bhai Ishwar Bhai Patel, in which under Section 24, subsection 2 of Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation, Resettlement Act, it was held that once the landowner refuses to accept the amount of compensation offered by the acquiring body, therefore it will not be open for the original landowner to pray for lapse of acquisition on the ground that the compensation has not been paid. The twin requirements that the, that is the land acquisition to lapse only when the acquiring body fails to pay compensation as well as does not take possession, does not stand satisfied in the case. The case of Indoor Development Authority versus Manohar Lal and others was also referred to. Coming to a few cases from uh, criminal law, the first case is Cardinal Mar George Ellen Cherry versus State of Kerala and another, a parchi of Bathory, represented through most reverend Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas versus State of Kerala and others, etc. Catholic Diocese of Tamarisari, represented through Mar Remigois in Chanel, was a state of Kerala and others. The distinction was made between the provisions under section 156 subsection 3 and section 202 subsection 1 of CRPC. The case pertains to the entertainment of a second complaint after the order of dismissal under section 203 CRPC. It was held while hearing a criminal appeal against the judgment declining to interfere in the orders of the trial court, summoning the section, summoning order uh, under section 120B, 406, 423, read with section 34 IPC, by reiterating the law laid down by Honorable Supreme Court in Ramdev Food Products Private versus State of Gujarat, wherein drawing the distinction between the provisions contained in section 156, subsection 3, and section 202, subsection 1 of CRPC, the Honorable uh, Court examined the scheme of the set sections and after discussing various earlier decisions, concluded that power under section 156 subsection 3 can be invoked by the magistrate before taking cognizance and was in the nature of preemptory reminder or intimation to the police to exercise its plenary power of investigation beginning with section 156 and ending with the report under section 173 of charge sheet. On the other hand, Section 202 applies at the post cognizant stage and the direction for investigation was for the purpose of deciding 
whether there was sufficient ground to proceed. The Honorable Supreme Court further reiterated the law laid down in Pramathanath Talukdar versus Saroj Ranjan Sarkar, Jitinder Singh and others versus Ranjit Kaur, Ranveer Singh versus State of Haryana, Poonam Chand Jain and other versus Fazru, and Samta Naidu and another versus State of Madhya Pradesh and other, where it was observed that an order of dismissal under Section 203 of CRPC is, however, no bar to the entertainment of a second complaint on the same facts, but it will be entertained only in exceptional circumstances. Example, where the previous order was passed on an incomplete record or on a misunderstanding or of the nature of the complaint, or it was manifestly absurd, unjust or foolish, or where new facts which could not, with reasonable diligence, have been brought on the record in the previous proceedings have been adduced. In other cases, Ms. X versus State of Maharashtra, and another in which the right of the prosecutrix to participate in the criminal proceeding uh, was discussed, that there's a recourse available to an accused upon addition of further cognizable and non bailable offenses to the FIR after the grant of bail. It was held by hearing a criminal appeal against the judgment granting anticipatory bail to accuse in case under section 354, 354B and 506 of the Indian Penal Code. The Honorable Supreme Court held that an approach of not paying any heed to the pleas taken by the prosecutrix tantamounts to failure to recognize the right of prosecutrix to participate in the criminal proceedings that would include a right to oppose the application for anticipatory bail moved by the accused. The Honorable Court reiterated the view taken in Jagjit Singh and, and others versus Ashish Mishra, alias Mono and another, relating to the victim's right to be heard. The Honorable High Court, the Supreme Court, citing Pradeep Ram versus State of Jharkhand and another, noted that addition of the serious offense can be a circumstance where a court can direct that the accused be arrested and committed to custody, even though an order of bail was earlier granted in his favor in respect of the offenses with which he was charged when his application was of bail was considered and a favorable order was passed. The recourse available to an accused in a situation where after the grant of bail, further cognizable and non-bailable offenses are added to the FIR is for him to surrender and apply a fresh for bail in respect of the newly offended newly added offenses. The investigating agency is also entitled to move the court for seeking the custody of the accused by invoking the provisions of section 437 subsection 5 and section 439 subsection 2 CRPC falling under chapter 23 of the statute that deals with the provisions relating to bails and bonds. On such application being moved, the court may have released the accused on bail or the appellate's court or superior court in exercise of special power conferred upon it can direct a person who has been released on bail earlier to be arrested and taken into custody. The next case is Neeraj Datta versus state, of, uh, state Government of NCT of Delhi. In this case, the issue was with regard to the demand and acceptance of illegal ratification by a public servant. It was held while hearing a criminal appeal against the judgment upholding the conviction for the offenses punishable under Section 7 and Clause 1 and Clause 2 of Section 13, Subsection 1, Clause D, read with Section 13, Subsection 2 of the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. Honorable Supreme Court held that Section 7 as existed prior to 26 July 2018 was different from the present section. The unamended section 7 specifically refers to any gratification. The substituted section 7 does not use the word gratification, but it uses a wider term undue advantage. When the allegation is of demand of accused, it uh, when the allegation is of demand of gratification and acceptance thereof by the accused, it must be as a motive or reward for doing or forbearing to do any official act. The fact that the demand and acceptance of gratification were for motive or reward as provided in Section 7 can be proved by invoking the presumption under Section 20 provided the basic allegations of the demand and acceptance are proved in view of what is laid down by the Constitution Bench in Neeraj Datta versus State Government of NCT of Delhi. In a given case, the demand and acceptance of illegal gratification by a public servant can be proved by circumstantial evidence in the absence of direct oral or documentary evidence. While answering the referred question, the Constitution Bench has observed that it is 
permissible to draw an inferential deduction of culpability and or guilt of the public servant for the offences punishable under section 17 and 13 subsection 1 clause d read with section 13 subsection 2 of the pc act the conclusion is that in the absence of direct evidence the demand and or acceptance can always be proved by other evidence such as circumstantial evidence the honorable court further held that the allegation of demand of ratification and acceptance made by the public servant has to be established beyond a reasonable doubt the decision of the constitution bench does not dilute this elementary requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt the constitution bench was dealing with the issue of the modes by which the demand can be proved the constitution bench has laid down that the proof need not only be by direct oral or documentary evidence but it can be by by way of other evidence including circumstantial evidence when reliance is placed on circumstantial evidence to prove the demand for gratification the prosecution must establish each and every circumstance from which the prosecution wants the court to draw a conclusion of guilt the facts established must be consistent with only one hypothesis that there was a demand made for gratification by the accused therefore in this case we will have to examine whether there is any direct evidence of demand if we come to the conclusion that there is no direct evidence of demand the court will have to consider whether there is any circumstantial evidence to prove the demand the next case is narendra singh keshu bhai zala was a state of gujarat in which it was held while hearing a criminal appeal against a judgment upholding the conviction under section 302 read with section 34 ipc and section 25 subsection 1a and section 27 subsection 2 of the arms act that it is a settled principle of law that doubt cannot replace proof suspicion however so great it may be is of no substitute of proof in criminal jurisprudence only such evidence is admissible and acceptable as is permissible in accordance with law in the case of a sole eye witness the witness has to be reliable trustworthy his testimony worthy of credence and the case proven beyond reasonable doubt unnatural conduct and unexplained circumstances can be a ground for disbelieving the witness the next case is uday kumar versus state of tamil nadu which pertains to test identification parade it was held while hearing a criminal appeal against judgment upholding the conviction under section 302 of ipc that the entire necessity for holding an investigation parade can arise only when the accused are not previously known to the witnesses the whole idea of test identification parade is that witnesses who claim to have seen the culprits at the time of occurrence are to identify them from the midst of other persons without any aid or any other source next case is rava saheb alias raha rava saheb gowda etc was a state of karnataka in this case while hearing a criminal appeal against judgment holding the conviction under section 143 147 148 504 read with 302 of the indian penal code honorable supreme court noted some essential principles as under evidence of a style witness corroborated part of the evidence of a style witness regarding the commission of the offence is admissible merely because there is a deviation from the statement in the fir the witness statement cannot be termed totally unreliable the evidence of a hostile witness can form the basis of conviction the general principle of appreciating the evidence of the eye witness is that when a case involves a large number of offenders prudently it is necessary but not always for the court to see corroboration from at least two more witnesses as a measure of caution be that as it may the principle is quality over quantity of witnesses the judgment also discussed effects of omissions and deficiencies it was held that evidence examined as a whole must reflect or ring the truth the court must not give undue importance to omissions and discrepancies which do not uh, shake the foundation of the prosecution case honorable supreme court placed reliance upon rutash kumar versus state of haryana bhagwan jagannath markar versus state of maharashtra karan singh versus state of uttar pradesh with regard to the reliance on single witness it was held that if a witness is absolutely reliable then conviction based there upon cannot be said to be infirm in any manner reliance was also placed upon karuna karan was a state of tamil nadu and sadhuram was a state of rajasthan with regard to the testimony of a co close relative it was held 
that a witness being a close relative is not a ground enough to reject his testimony. Mechanical rejection of an even partisan or interested witness may lead to failure of justice. The principle of falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus is not one of general application. Reliance was placed upon Bhagwan Jagannath Market versus State of Maharashtra. On the preponderance of probability, it was held that to entitle a person to the benefit of doubt arising from the duality of views, the possible view in favor of the accused must be as nearly reasonable, probable as that against him. Reliance was placed upon Gopal Reddy versus State of Andhra Pradesh. With regard to delay in sending FIR, it was held that unless serious prejudice is caused, mere delay in sending FIR to the magistrate would not by itself have a negative effect on the case of prosecution. State was, uh, Reliance was placed upon state of Rajasthan versus Daud Khan. One of the external checks against the anti-dating or anti-timing in FIR is the time of its dispatch to the magistrate or its receipt by the magistrate. A dis a ma a dispatch of a copy of the FIR forthwith ensures that there is no manipulation of the interpolation in the FIR. Reliance was placed upon Mehraj versus State of UP and Ombi Singh versus State of UP. On the last in theory, it was held that on its own last in theory is considered to be a weak basis for conviction. However, when the same is coupled with other factors, such as when the disease was last seen with the accused, proximity of time to the recovery of the body of disease, the accused is bound to give an explanation under section 106 of the Evidence Act. If he does not do so or furnishes what may be termed as wrong explanation or if the motive is established, pleading sick pleading securely to the conviction of the accused, closing out the possibility of any other hypothesis, then the conviction can be based thereon. Reliance was placed upon Satpal Singh versus State of Haryana and Ram Gopal versus State of MP. Pertaining to the several accused persons with regard to the such cases, Section 149 of the Indian Penal Code is declaratory of the vicarious liability of the members of an unlawful assembly for acts done in prosecution of the common object of that assembly or for such offenses as the member of the unlawful assembly knew would be committed in prosecution of that object. If the unlawful assembly is formed with the common object of committing an offense and if that offense is committed in prosecution of the object by any number of the unlawful assembly, all the members of the assembly will be vicarious seriously liable for the offence even if one or more but not all committed the offence. Again, if an offence is committed by a member of an unlawful assembly and that offence is one which the members of the unlawful assembly knew to be likely to be committed in prosecution of the common object, every member who had that knowledge will be guilty of the offence so committed. Reliance was placed upon Hari versus State of UP and Shambhunath Singh versus State of Bihar. While overt act and active participation may indicate common intention of the person per per perpetrating the crime, the mere presence of the unlawful assembly may fasten vicariously like criminal liability under section 149 as held in the case of Lalji was a state of UP. When a case involves a large number of assailants, it is not possible for the witness to describe the part played therein by each of such person. It is not necessary for the prosecution to prove each of the members' involvement, especially regarding which or what act. Reliance was placed upon Masanti versus State of UP. With regard to the power of Court of Appeal, it was held that the Court of Appeal has wide powers of appreciation of evidence in an order of acquittal, as in the order of conviction, along with the rider of presumption of innocence, which continues across all stages of the cases. Such court should give due importance to the judgment rendered by the trial court. Reliance was placed upon Atle versus State of UP, referring to Guru Dutt Pathak versus State of UP, the judgment in Gita Devi versus State of UP. The court observed that the High Court, being the first appellate court, must discuss or reappreciate the evidence on record. Failure to do so is a good ground enough to remand the matter for consideration. Another case is Pawan Kumar Chaurasia versus State of Bihar, which pertains to extrajudicial confession. It says that hearing it says while hearing a criminal appeal against a conviction under section 302 read with section 34 as well as section 201 of the Indian Penal Code, Honorable Supreme Court held that as far as extrajudicial confession is concerned, the law is well settled. Generally, it is a weak piece of evidence. However, a conviction can be sustained on the basis of extrajudicial confession. Provided that the confession is proved to be voluntary and truthful, it should be free of any inducement 
the evidentiary value of such confession also depends on the person to whom it is made going by the natural course of human conduct normally a person would confide about a crime committed by him only with such a person in whom he has implicit faith normally a person would not make a confession to someone who is totally a stranger to him moreover the court has to be satisfied with the reliability of the confession keeping in view the circumstances in which it is made as a matter of rule corroboration is not required however if an extra judicial confession is corroborated by other evidence on record it acquires more credibility the next case is karan fatya alias fatya was a state of madhya pradesh in this case it was the question was that once an accused after conviction at the stage of appeal is held to be a juvenile or child under the provisions of the 2015 act what would be the status of the trial the conviction and the sentence recorded by the trial court and the appellate courts Uh, hearing a criminal appeal upholding the conviction under section 363 376 sub section 2 clause 1 of the indian penal code section 5 sub section m and 6 of the pocso act and section 302 and 201 ipc honorable supreme court having considered the statutory provisions laid down in section 7 Uh, 7a of 2000 act and section 9 of 2015 which is identical Call to Section Nine of 2015 Act, approving the view taken in the cases Chitendra Singh, alias Babu Singh, and another was a state of Uttar Pradesh. Mahesh was a state of Rajasthan, and others, and Satyadev, alias Bure, was a state of UP. Held that the merits of the conviction could be tested, and the conviction which was recorded cannot be held to be vitiated in law merely because inquiry was not conducted by JGB. It is only the question of sentence for which the provisions of the 2015 Act. would be attracted and any sentence in excess of what is permissible under the 2015 act will have to be accordingly amended as per the provisions of 2015 act the next case is premchand versus state of maharashtra the law pertaining to section 313 crpc was summarized while hearing an appeal upholding the conviction under section 302 and 307 of the indian penal code honorable supreme court noting the judgments of state of up versus lakhmi extensively dealing with the aspect of value or utility of statement under section 313 crpc sanatan naskar was a state of west bengal dealing with the object of section 313 crpc reena hazarika was a state of assam adverting the rational behind the requirement to comply with the section 313 crpc parvinder kaur was a state of punjab restating the importance of section 313 cp cpc upon noticing the view taken in reena hazarika and m abbas was a state of kerala summarize the law as under section 313 crpc clause b of subsection 1 is a valuable safeguard in the trial process for the accused to establish his innocence section 313 which is intended to ensure a direct dialogue between the court and the accused cast a mandatory duty on the court to question the accused generally on the case for the purpose of enabling him to personally explain any circumstances appearing in the evidence against him when questioned the accused may not admit his involvement at all and choose to flatly deny or outrightly repudiate whatever is put to him by the court the accused may even admit or own incriminating evidence adduced against him to adopt legally recognized defenses an accused can make a statement without fear or being cross examined by the prosecution or the later having any right to cross examine him the explanations that the accused may furnish cannot be considered in isolation but has to be considered in conjunction with the evidence adduced by the prosecution and therefore no conviction can be premised solely on the basis of section 313 statements statement of the accused in course of examination under section 313 since not on oath do not constitute evidence under section 3 of the evidence act yet the answers given are relevant for finding the truth and examining the veracity of the prosecution case statements of the accused cannot be dissected to rely on the inculpatory part and ignore the exculpatory part and has or have to be read in the whole inter alia to test the authenticity of the exculpatory nature of the admission and if the accused takes a defense and proffers any alternate version of events or interpretation the court has to carefully analyze and consider his statements any failure to consider the accused explanation of incriminating circumstances in a given case may vitiate the trial and or endanger the conviction 
Honorable Supreme Court further noted that bearing the above well settled principles in mind, every criminal court proceeding under section under clause B of subsection one of section 313 has to shoulder the owner's responsibility of scanning the evidence after the prosecution closes its case to trace the incriminating circumstance in the evidence against the accused and to prepare relevant questions to extend opportunity to the accused to explain any such circumstance in the evidence that could be used against him. In the case of uh, Juru and others versus Kareem and another, the power of summoning under section 319 CRPC was discussed while hearing a criminal appeal against judgment, setting aside the order passed by the additional session judge ordering the summoning under section 319 of CRPC as additional accused in case under, under section 304B, 498A, 406, 323 and 34 of the penal Code, Honorable Supreme Court noting the judgment of Hardeep Singh versus State of Punjab and Supal Singh Khera versus State of Punjab held that it is thus manifested from a conjoint reading of the cited decisions the power of summoning under Section 319 CRPC is not to be exercised routinely, and the existence of more than a prima facie case is a sign qua non to summon an additional accused. The Honorable Supreme Court further held that with a view to prevent the frequent misuse of power to summon additional accused under Section 319 CRPC, and in conformity with the binding judicial dictum's effort, the procedural safeguard can be that ordinarily the summoning of a person at the very threshold of the trial may be discouraged, and the trial court must have evaluate the evidence against the persons whom to be summoned and then adjudge whether such material is more or less carry the same weightage and value as has been testified against those who are already facing trial. In the absence of any credible evidence, the power under section 319 CRPC ought not to be invoked. A few cases from the environmental law. The first case is Swetap Kumar versus Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and others. Uh, in this case, declarants of exotic life species as per 2020 MOEFCC advisory immune from prosecution under Wildlife Act and future amendments. It was clarified that individuals who have made a declaration of ownership of exotic life species in accordance with the 2020 advisory issued by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change are immune from prosecution under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 or action under any future laws or amendments. The next is uh, Indian Oil Corporation Limited versus VBR Menon. The issue was whether the NGT has a jurisdiction to direct the CPCB that it should in exercise of its power under Section 5 of the Act 1986, making it mandatory to obtain the CTE and CTO for all the petroleum retails outlets across the country. It was held that it is not inclined to disturb the impugned directions issued by the NGT regarding installation of the vapor recovery device circular and directed the CPCB to ensure that these directions are scrupulously followed and complied with. The court held that it is not necessary to make obtaining of CTE and CTO mandatory and directed the CPCB to ensure that its guidelines are scrupulously followed and once the guidelines are scrupulously followed, there too no direction to obtain CTE and CTO. For Starting or operating a petroleum outlet is warranted. The court issued the following directions. CPCB shall ensure that the directions issued by the NGT as contained in para 69 1 and 2 of the impugned order are fully complied with. The state pollution control boards must ensure that the directions issued by the NGT about the installation of the VRS mechanism are complied with within the fresh timeline of the prescribed by the CPCB. The next case is Tushar Goswami versus Uni Union of India and others. In this case, it was held that the National Green Tribunal has constituted a seven member joint committee to investigate alleged environmental violation by the tent city project, which is situated on the riverbed of the Ganga River in Varanasi. The project is alleged to be harmful to the environment and causing untreated sewage to flow directly into the river Ganga. The tent city project in Varanasi on the Ganga river bed is said to have violated the river Ganga rejuvenation project protection and management authorities order 2016 and prohibits construction on the river bed. The next case is Gaurav Sharma versus Government of NCT of Delhi. 
In this case, the principal bench of NGT has constituted a seven-member committee to look into the failure of authorities in controlling air pollution around All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. An application was submitted which stated that the significant number of hawkers, shopkeepers and vehicles are contributing the pollution and hindering the timely movement of ambulances. Pavements are encroached by residents or commercial activities, it was alleged. The next case is Abhish Kusum Gupta was a state of Uttar Pradesh and others. In this case, the principal bench of NGT directs a joint committee headed by the Chief Secretary of Uttar Pradesh to take immediate remedial action to control pollution in the Hindan River. The committee has also been ordered to deploy field monitoring teams to accurately assess the ground level situation. The next is in reference news item in NDTV dated 28th of February 2023, titled to dead to injured in explosion at Gujarat Pharma Company. It was it was uh, held in this case by award by the NGT. The compensation of 10 lakh rupees to the victims of the recent Gujarat explosion incident. The bench rejected the argument that the NGT is, is barred from granting the compensation to the workmen under Section 17 of the NGT Act 2013 on the basis that they are eligible for compensation under the Worksmen Compensation Act 1923. The next case is Harpal Singh Rana and another was the state of Uttarakhand. In this case, NGT has directed a joint committee to take remedial measures and execute an action plan to ensure proper utilization of water that is wasted during the construction of metro rail in Delhi, Jaipur and Mumbai. An application was filed raising concerns about the wastage of water caused by the discharge during the construction of metro rail in Delhi, Jaipur and Mumbai. And the last case from the environmental law is Sarvabhum Bagali versus State of Karnataka and others, in which the NGT South Zone has imposed a penalty of 50 crore rupees on the Irrigation Department of Karnataka for conducting mining activities in Adyapi and Shamburu dams in Dakshin Kannada district without obtaining environmental clearance in violation of environmental impact assessment notification of 2006. The bench was comprising of Justice Pushpa Satnarayana, judicial member and Dr. Satya Gopal Kurulapati, expert member, held that dredging and distilling of dams are not exempted from obtaining prior, uh, prior environmental clearance as the sand was being extracted for commercial purposes. So these were the important judgments for the month of March 2023. These judgments uh, are there in the e-newsletter, which is monthly published by Chandigarh Judicial Academy. The e-newsletter for the March 2023 is available on our website as cja.gov.in and the same is accessible and can be read from there. It can be downloaded from our website also. So with this, uh, I shall take a leave from all the audience and with some other presentation on some other issue, I shall be meeting you again. Till then, Namaskar.